but the, the book has, has taken me many places too and, and connected me with so many amazing you know, trans scholars and activists and you know, the people who have come into my life as a result of working on this. It, it's just been absolutely incredible. Um, yeah, just absolutely incredible. And of course, uh, in the course of, of working on this biography, then I started identifying as trans and better understanding who I was. And it was actually one night when I was you know, transcribing Lou's journals at my computer, I came across this, this passage that he had, had written. It was actually in a letter to his ex-boyfriend when he was explaining his desire to transition. And he said something to the effect of, you know, if I were on my deathbed, this would be something that I would regret not doing, transitioning. And I just got goosebumps all over, and I, I, I had to, to kind of push back from the computer and ask myself, you know, if I were on my deathbed, would I regret not transitioning? And the answer was yes, absolutely. So I, I started transitioning, and I, I found courage in Lou's story to be able to, to transition myself. Because here was a, a guy who had overcome tremendous obstacles in order to be who he was, and then dedicated his life to helping others do the same. And when things got challenging so many times, I would go back to, to, Lou's, to Lou's words and his work, and, and it would give me courage to, to continue on. So one of the many reasons why I'm so grateful to have published this, and that I, I stuck with it, is because I know that he changed my life, and I know that he can continue to do the same for others. You know, especially in, in these tough political times, you know, it's, it, it's very helpful to know that there have been people who have gone before us, and, and to hear their stories, and uh, to draw strength and inspiration from them. Uh, it's, it was kind of trippy, too, to realize that, you know, I was writing the biography of a guy who had written a biography of <laughs> another trans guy. <laughs> Here's actually you know, the biography that Lou wrote of a guy named Jack B. Garland. Um, this was in the late 1800s in San Francisco. But it was, it was fascinating working on this um, and to be aware of the ways in which, as I was writing this, ways in which my own experiences were coming through. And that was something that he had talked about as well too. Sorry to get you know, kind of mad on you. <laughs> but um, it, was, it was a really cool experience. Um, in terms of you know, reasons why you know, we, we wrote these you know, biographies, so first and foremost, they're just really, really, really good stories. So for those of you who don't know much about Lou, I'll read a, a brief segment to you that kind of encapsulates all that he did. This is from the beginning of the last chapter. Lou lived out his final days with an enviable awareness of and appreciation for life. He had pulled through his health crisis in the summer of 1989 and would astound everyone by pulling through several more health crises over the next two years. Lou continued to pull through because there was still more work that he needed to do. Lou would eventually die three months before his 40th birthday. Far too young by our standards, but Lou was at peace when he died because he felt that he had accomplished everything that he set out to do. By the time that he died, Lou had published two books, Transform Gender Professionals Understanding of FDM Gender Identity and Sexuality, organized FDM individuals around the world into a community, and helped start the modern day trans movement. Perhaps most importantly, Lou inspired everyone who knew or knew of him to live their lives fully and authentically. Something, uh, among the many things that, that Lou did, I feel like one of his great contributions too was his emphasis on the importance of history and the value of those who <coughs> come before us. He not only published this biography of, of Jack B. Garland, <coughs> he also published this information uh, 
for the female to male cross dresser and transsexual booklet that was very, very, um, that was basically considered for, you know, for many trans men like their Bible. It was their how to guide for getting through life. And it was important to him that, to include many historical figures in that as well. I think he, he ended up with like 30 different little biographical sketches of people who had gone before. And he also published an f to m newsletter and would include excerpts about trans men from the past. And what I'm going to read to you now is, um, is about the importance of, of history. For Lou, the realization that others like him had existed throughout history had done a lot to validate his identity and alleviate his sense of isolation. And he was excited for the opportunity to help bring other f to ms to the same realization. Lou reiterated the value of history in the recap of you know, the, the particular get-together, after a get-together that they had. And he published in the, the quarterly newsletter about the importance of history. See, Lou illustrated the importance of history again in the spring 1989 issue of the FTM newsletter. In that issue, the recently deceased jazz musician Billy Tipton was given front page coverage. Tipton had lived 50 years as a man and Lou identified him as one of our grandfathers, telling his readers, quote, Sometimes we neglect to remember the many f to ms who have done or are doing it on their own. Tipton lived in a time when there were no gender counselors, no doctors to prescribe hormones, no surgeons to perform chest or genital surgery. If you wanted to live as a man, you just had to make do with what you had. We owe a tribute of thanks to him for living the way he felt most comfortable, having the wisdom to understand what he had to do and doing it. Men like Billy Tipton proved that we, as f to ms are not a bizarre, bizarre recent phenomenon, that throughout history, there have been females who knew deep down that they were men and did whatever they had to do to live their lives honestly. Lou was well aware of the difficulties of identifying and living as an f to m in the 1980s, but he believed that historical perspective enabled one to recognize the benefits of the present. <clears throat> Also, through his coverage of Tipton, Lou implied that FDMs had a history, which was an important notion for an identity-based community. When Lou got his AIDS diagnosis in the years 1987, there were two things that, two goals that he really wanted to accomplish before he died. And this is what he wrote in his journals. One was to publish Garland's biography, to finish this. And the second thing that he wanted to do was to publish his journals. Lou kept journals regularly from the age of 10 until his death, you know, a few months before he turned 40 years old. And these journals are incredible. <laughs> um, but Lou, that was one goal that Lou never got around to accomplishing, publishing his journals. I want to read a, another excerpt regarding that. Publishing his journals was one life goal Lou set for himself that he failed to meet. And he met all sorts of goals. I would say that's about the only one. <laughs> it was likely a combination of Lou's lifelong struggles with insecurity, the consciousness of his fallibility, his historian's bent, and his aversion to sensationalism that prevented Lou from publishing his journals before he died, despite the encouragement he received from others to do so. But there was also the important role that death itself plays in one's life story. And while he lived, there remained events, thoughts, and experiences for Lou to document. And he did, right up until just a couple of days before he died. Uh, I feel like it was also a gift that Lou didn't write his biography because I felt like he left behind so many pieces of himself that others of us are now able to access and pick up and put together. And I feel like in, in not telling the definitive story of his life, he has enabled <coughs> us to basically uh, write our own stories of who Lou is and what he means to us. But using, of course, all of the resources that he provided. So in addition to the journals that he kept, 
Um, he also kept copies of all of his correspondence to folks. Um, he had tons and tons of research that he did as well. I mean, his, his collection is just absolutely incredible, the materials that he left behind. I'd like to next read a little bit about Lou and Jack Garland. Even though Lou did not publish his autobiography or his journals, he felt like in writing Garland's story, there was enough of him in this to leave behind. The publication of Garland's biography caused Lou to feel so overwhelmed with pride that he cried. It's not just that I'm proud of my work, he explained, but that it's so wonderful to see this incredibly beautiful person, my Jack B. Garland, finally honored with a book of his life, a permanent tribute for generations to come. He came so close to being forgotten forever. Nearing the end of his life, Lou wrote in his journal that, quote, though it is Garland's story, it tells about me. It explains my reality for future generations of female to gay males. For though the details of their lives differ dramatically, Lou felt like the core experience of what it meant to be a gay F to M transcended time and place. <coughs> Lou also said, regarding the book, to actually see this wonderful story and those beautiful pictures all together in a fine book I am so proud. If I can just last long enough, if I can just live long enough to see this book, I'll be fulfilled. I just want it in libraries all over, so when someone, like I was at age 21, is searching the libraries for mention of a female to male, their garland will be proud and beautiful. I am so lucky. I am truly actualizing all the dreams I had for myself while young, i.e., to be a man, to be a gay man, to be a published writer. That is why I feel at peace with my impending death. It's okay. Lou was diagnosed with AIDS on New Year's 1987. During the 80s, life expectancy for folks with AIDS was not very long at all. And he actually lived with AIDS for four years. At that time, that was astonishing. There are not many folks for whom that was the case. I very much feel like, in large part, what kept Lou going for so long was the fact that he had so much more work that he wanted to do. That his diagnosis really helped <clears throat> focus his efforts and also gave, gave him a reason to live. Here's a little bit about that. This was after uh, Lou had had a, a health crisis. As letters and phone calls poured in, Lou noted with a bit of astonishment that all the female to males who have benefited from my work in the community are coming forward and telling me things like, I'm their hero. Lou was not mistaken in referring to an FDM community at this point in time. Over the past several years, thousands of FDMs around the world had found and stayed in contact with one another through correspondence, organizations and publications, benefiting greatly from an infrastructure that Lou worked tirelessly to help build. And his fellow FDMs were not mistaken in identifying Lou as a hero. He had faced and overcome many challenges, and in the face of death, the only challenge that Lou could not overcome. He gave his life to helping other FDMs thrive in theirs. It was his work on behalf of FDMs that gave meaning to Lou's life. This work made him want to live, and he did so for an astonishing four years after his AIDS diagnosis, three years longer than statistics at the time said he should. After his relationship with Keith ended, sex and romantic relationships took a backseat to Lou's F to M activism. He poured all of his heart and soul into creating a world where F to Ms could be their authentic selves. In private, Lou struggled with his AIDS diagnosis, but in public, he bent it to his will. In the eyes of gender professionals, Lou's AIDS diagnosis gave him gravitas, for AIDS was considered a gay disease. And Lou's AIDS diagnosis gave him an almost superhuman drive and focus when it came to F to M advocacy, organizing, and scholarship. In just four short years, 
who accomplished more than most activists do in a lifetime. Now, Blue held quarterly F to M get-togethers in San Francisco, and you know, it, was, it was a chance just to get folks in the area to come together and actually be in community with one another. People had even come down from Seattle to attend the ones in, in San Francisco. Folks from all over the state would come as well. But he, he held a get-together here in his native Milwaukee. It was actually the second to last get-together that he ever hosted. And he hosted it during his last trip to Milwaukee. I want to read a little bit about that experience to you all. And the get-together was held in the summer of 1990. Lou hosted the get-together at his childhood home. Lou's mother was very supportive of his hosting the get-together and pleased when another FDM's mother joined her in attending. In total, eight FDMs attended, including one from Madison, Wisconsin, one from Iowa, two from Chicago, who were lovers, and another from rural Illinois. Writing about this historic Midwest FDM get-together in the FDM newsletter, Lou hoped that our brothers from the Midwest would continue to stay in contact with each other. In fact, they did, and several FDMs from Milwaukee even regularly attended meetings in Chicago before Michael Munson founded Forge in 1994, a Milwaukee-based organization for those on the transmasculine spectrum and their significant others, friends, family, and allies that Munson has run with his partner, Larry Cook Daniels, since 2000. And something that Lou had actually encouraged folks to do was to find ways to try and incorporate partners and significant others into um, their F to M groups. And he encouraged people all over the country to do this. And in so many ways, his group served as a model for other groups around the country and even the world. Um, so he would write up about you know, what happened at their events in the newsletter, and the newsletter went you know, all over the world. And unfortunately, that is not something that groups all over the country followed. However, you know, Forge absolutely has always included significant others. And I think that that's also a testament to who Michael and Marie are as people to acknowledge you know, the important role that our, our loved ones play and that you know, they are all, we are all a part of the same community. This visit to Milwaukee proved to be Lou's last. Sitting in the childhood bedroom that he had shared with his now deceased sister Kathleen, Lou wrote, this house and this city still seem to me to be home, although I would never want to live here again, and nothing draws me here. He shared the sentiments of many people who leave their childhood homes for places where they feel a greater sense of opportunity and freedom to be who they are. San Francisco is not home, Lou wrote, but it amuses and keeps me in awe, and I love living there. Home was not only where Lou spent his childhood, but where he came of age, where he first began discovering who he was, first fell in love, first belonged to a community. Time and place were inextricably linked. Lou could not return to that time and, by extension, that place. Nor did he want to, for while Lou had grown up and come of age in Milwaukee, it was in San Francisco that he became a man. And it was in that time and place, San Francisco at the height of the AIDS epidemic and the beginning of the trans movement, that Lou made a place for himself in history. And again, right, the parallels of writing the biography of a biographer, you know, I could very much relate to this whole the sense of, of home. Only for me, you know, Milwaukee is, is my San Francisco, basically. But this is, this is where I, I became a man and, um, and found community. And this is actually, I, I find this portion of Lou's life the most exciting in part maybe because it is Milwaukee and it's so neat to actually be able to physically go to the places where Lou had been, you know, like where uh, GPU, where the Gay People's Union used to meet, you know, to see all of these places. But um, another reason why I really enjoy this, this period in Lou's life is because it was so exciting and so full of possibility. You know, he was just discovering who he was, right? As, as soon as I started writing this, I already knew how the story ended. <laughs> I knew that, that poor Lou died of AIDS. 
But I then, you know, set out to try and figure out, well, how did he become this person? And how did he find the courage to do these things? Who, who was Lou that he did inspire so many people and was able to do these things? And it was, it was, it was really enjoyable to, to go back and to see who he was when he was in his early 20s in Milwaukee. The years 1973 to 1975 were a time of great excitement and discovery for Lou. In his early 20s, Lou came to better understand who he might become by ruling out that which he was not. Lou graduated from trying on the masculinities of particular individuals as he had growing up. That's something I described in the first chapter was how you know, he would very much identify, say, with particular uh, musicians like um, Lou Reed, for example, that's actually his namesake. He took on the name of Lou because he, he so emulated Lou Reed, the musician. And the name just kind of stuck. Um, also, you know, the, the Beatles when he was even younger. But, you know, he went from trying on these different masculinities to actually trying on different identities. And his ongoing effort to embody who he was in a world where gay trans men supposedly <coughs> did not exist. GPU and Milwaukee's gay community offered Lou a safe space for sexual experimentation, provided him with an unparalleled sense of belonging, and laid the foundation for his future FTM activism. Now when Lou was in his early 20s, you know, all he knew was that he was attracted to, to gay men and that he wanted to be a man himself. But at the time, Gay to, or gay trans men supposedly did not exist. There was nothing in the medical literature about one being able to be both gay and trans. So there's nothing in, in the literature, in the medical literature, also nothing in the communities saying, oh yeah, of course, you know, of course there are gay trans people. Um, however, Lou still found welcome in Milwaukee's gay community. And another thing that I really enjoyed getting to do in writing this book was telling Milwaukee's history. You know, because everyone just kind of assumes that the gay liberation movement is something that happened on the coast, you know, the end. But actually here in Milwaukee, you know, the, the organization GPU was recognized internationally. There were amazing things going on there, right? We had a community center, crisis line, library, and we had that newsletter that was distributed all around the world. Um, there were just incredible things that were taking place right here. And Milwaukee differed from the coast too, in that, in, in my you know, analysis, Milwaukee was much more welcoming of trans people. I think that there are different reasons for that, you know, one of which being that it was a smaller community, so, you know, with a smaller community, you're not going to have, like, uh, subgroups, or as many subgroups, right? You're not going to have folks splitting off, gays over here, lesbians over here, trans folks over here. Instead, it's, hey, you know, we've kind of got this smaller community, we're all in this together. But it was cool because that, with that heterogeneity, they were able to learn so much from each other. And, and I feel like um, the contributions that Lou was later able to make with his trans organizing can definitely be traced back to his experiences with GPU. Um, for example, you know, he, he, he employed F to M as an all-inclusive category of folks along the trans masculine spectrum, that all those folks were included under um, the identity of F to M. Just as here in Milwaukee, gay was an all-inclusive category that included you know, gays, lesbians, transvestites, and transsexuals. I'm going to read a couple of quick uh, excerpts about gay, uh, gay People's Union. Lou loved the general GPU meetings, which he enthusiastically attended every Monday night. Lou became an official member of GPU on May 7, 1973, which made him feel that he belonged, that he was a part of Milwaukee's gay community. His experiences in GPU also taught Lou invaluable community organizing skills that he would later use in founding the FTM community, including organizing and, and executing meetings, networking, producing newsletters, and perhaps most importantly, 
employing an all-inclusive identity <coughs> category that welcomed many disparate individuals into the fold. From its inception, <coughs> GPU News, the newsletter, concerned itself with representing the views of the entire gay community, reflecting GPU leaders' notion that gay was an all-inclusive category of identification that encompassed gays, lesbians, bisexuals, transvestites, and transsexuals. And at that time, you know, folks uh, were very invested in, in dividing themselves up between <coughs> transvestites and transsexuals, in large part because that's how they were discussed in the medical literature. And that would also then determine whether you were going to try and access services or not, say, to a transition if you're transsexual. GPU's inclusiveness resulted in a heterogeneous community that created space for dialogues across differences. It also created space for someone like Lou to explore who he was, feel supported in his journey, and know he was part of a greater whole. Now, in 1973, that seemed to kind of be a, a key year in the gay liberation movement and, and the, the gay community on a national scale, where, where there were several high-profile incidences of trans exclusion. So Susan Stryker has actually identified 1973 as kind of a, a turning point in that way and as a, just a dark time for trans folks within the movement. And that's what uh, this next paragraph I'm going to read to addresses. Then as now, the gay community did not exist as some singular, homogenous entity. Lou's experiences with GPU highlight the fact that the gay community was actually comprised of many local communities. <coughs> Further, while the gay community on a national scale was engaged in a debate over trans inclusion, <coughs> This debate was also carried out within local communities, and the outcomes were by no means the same everywhere. GPU leaders demonstrated themselves to be favorable toward trans inclusion within the Milwaukee gay community and encouraged others to be the same. Let's see. Silvia Rivera was one of the people, um, Eldon Murray, the editor of GPU News, one of the people that he lauded to GPU news readers, and rather than preventing trans people from speaking, GPU gave them platforms to do so through news coverage and meetings. And during its own debate over trans inclusion in the summer of 1973, Milwaukee's lesbians and gay men came to a different conclusion than their counterparts in New York and San Francisco as to whether or not drag queens were offensive to cisgender or non-transgender. And this was um, basically, you know, over whether um, whether or not to have a, a drag ball. GPU did decide to hold the drag ball, and here is um, here's some more on, on trans inclusion. Let's see, at the time, in, back in 1973. Right? Lou was equally hesitant to admit to himself and to his fellow GPU members that he wanted to transition. However, GPU leaders not only accepted trans people like Lou, but, quote, felt the gays have a lot to learn by far out cases like ours. Before long, <laughs> before long, the rest of GPU's membership shared this sentiment, and their acceptance went a long way toward Lou's acceptance of himself. At least once a week, you know, Lou assisted with the publication of GPU News by typing, typesetting, and doing whatever else was needed. Lou often socialized with GPU members in the bars and participated in many GPU social activities. In the fall of 73, Eldon and the GPU president, Alan Hess, encouraged Lou to run for a leadership position in GPU, and he ran for secretary. And when folks found out he was running, Nobody wanted to run against him. <laughs> By November of that year, Lou was GPU's contact person for anyone seeking information about transvestism. I've never felt such acceptance before, Lou wrote in his journal. I've never been in a group like that. I mean, like in high school, even grade school, I was always left out of things, and at GPU, I feel so wanted. People accept me as a female transvestite, even though there's really not supposed to be such a now, during these years, 
rather than identifying as a gay trans man, because they supposedly didn't exist, the identity that seemed to be most accurate for Lou was female transvestite, because he enjoyed dressing up uh, you know, in men's clothes, but he was attracted to men. So, and, and lots of the, the literature would basically say that transvestites were, were really heterosexual. Right? So like in, in Luke's case, that would have applied because you know, he was still seen as being female, but he was attracted to men. So this seemed to kind of apply. Uh, but the, the medical literature talked a lot about male transvestites, but supposedly female transvestites didn't exist because it was so much more socially acceptable for women to wear men's clothing. So it was like just a category that didn't even exist, but um, it was kind of floating around there, and that's what Lou identified as at the time, and of course, the folks at GPU just welcomed him with, with open arms. Uh, let's see. It wasn't only the folks in GPU who welcomed Lou, though. It was also the broader gay community. In finding community, Lou was able to begin giving voice to the experiences of trans people. And he did so, um, this comes after my discussion of several articles that he published in GPU News, which uh, these articles were distributed all around the world. And several folks have reprinted these in other newsletters as well. The gay liberation activists mm -hmm. did not make up the gay community, nor would they have thought to claim as much. While activists may have been the mouthpiece of the community, its breeding grounds were the gay bars. Lou was also welcomed in the gay bars. In the fall of 1973, Lou began going out to the gay bars multiple times during the week, usually with his friend Charles, who was a ballet dancer. They frequented the River Queen and the factory, which featured a DJ and light show in the days before disco and consistently took out a full page ad in GP. Now, the factory was actually where the Skylight Opera Theater is now. So just as a point of reference. <laughs> After a few drinks at the bar, Lou let my fantasies take over so much, I was shocked they weren't a reality. In the bars, dressed in his leather jacket, Lou was no longer Sheila the female transvestite, but Lou. He would check out men with Charles, talk to friends from GPU, flirt and dance with drag queens and gay men, was occasionally successful at picking up men. However, despite the joys of sleeping with gay men, at times, Lou would become depressed and feel guilty, thinking, I have to make boys be heterosexual to have sex with me. <coughs> Lou would not, could not forego sex for the sake of his gender identity. Nothing made Lou feel more like a man than having sex with a gay man, for gay men were attracted to other men, and betting gay men validated his gender identity. Lou was concerned that having sex with gay men could only be rendered heterosexual due to his female genitalia. Now, romantic and sexual partners are in a very powerful position to both shape and validate our identities because of the ways in which they touch our bodies and our psyches. And this was something that definitely came up in my work on Lou, was thinking about the ways in which the people who he loved and with whom he interacted, how they either challenged or validated his own identity. Now, Lou had two long-term boyfriends throughout his life, and I used pseudonyms for both. Um, the first, um, the pseudonym was Mark, the second one is Keith, and both relationships had a profound impact on Lou, as you'll see when you read the book. Um, you know, I, I, I think now every time I ever go to a book reading, something I'm going to ask the author is what they left out of the book that they wish could have been included. <laughs> you know, there were so many things that I cut out, right? My dissertation was 500 pages, right? This is like 275, right? And, for that, <laughs> and the dissertation, I'd already cut out so much even to get to that. <laughs> um, but, you know, something, uh, you know, one of the things that I found tough to cut out of here was actually discussing, um, you know, more of, of 
what sex was for Lou, and and um, just some of the, the details of, of having sex with the men in his life. Um, just because you know, it just it, it didn't quite fit in, and it felt like you know when I was trying to plug it in, it that it would just you know be sensationalistic, and that isn't something that I was going for. Um, but something that I, I just found so like so so moving was that um, that I'll share with you all is that his his boyfriend Keith is something that he would do is that you know he sometimes he would stand behind Lou and position his penis between Lou's legs and and tell Lou look look now you have a penis and and enable Lou to really see what it was like to to have one and to very much see him himself in the mirror and I just I thought that was so cool um, but here's a, a little bit about Lou and, and Keith and their love and sex. Lou was overwhelmed how good sex is with someone I love so much. He marveled at how with Keith, I am there when I have sex. I'm not fantasizing about men together or of some other sex scene. I am feeling my body against his. I am feeling his hands touching me. I am excited as I look at him <coughs> as he looks at me. Such feelings I have never known. He always refers to me in the masculine, and there is no doubt we are two men who love each other. Keith gave Lou a sense of being part of the world that he had never experienced before. <coughs> Keith made Lou feel strong and good, and as though I am important. Now, when they got together, you know, Lou's focus shifted. You know, he, he took a step back from his trans activism. And he wanted to, to focus all of his time and energy on his life with Keith. You know, and they would you know, play board games, you know, do picnics on the weekends, all of these kinds of things. You know, and Lou really enjoyed this time, um, you know, as he described it. You know, it's it kind of a break from being a, 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 you know, just a trans person. He was, he felt like he was able to, to access, you know, a, a, another one of life's <coughs> great joys. Um, but, you know, Lou and Keith ended up breaking up. And I'd like to read a bit to you all about what they were both struggling with. Keith loved Lou very much, but the only romantic future that he could imagine for himself involved marrying a woman. In the early 1980s, gay marriage was an impossibility. Gay and straight people alike conflated marriage with heterosexuality, and while many gays and lesbians enjoyed the freedom of embracing alternate romantic arrangements, lacking the option of marriage could also make it difficult to imagine how long-term love and commitment between gay people would be manifested, or if it could be at all. Keith's solution to this uncertainty was that Lou should cease hormones and go back to living as a woman so they could marry and live happily ever after. Keith loved and wanted to be with Lou. It did not matter to him what Lou's body looked like, whether he was male, female, or a combination of the two. Vaginal penetration was Keith's preferred method of sexual contact, but he consistently validated Lou's gender identity and always used masculine pronouns in reference to him, even referring to his pussy which Lou found amusing. <laughs> For Lou, it's just a reverse. Lou's love transcended societal expectations, but was constrained by his embodiment. He was committed to loving Keith however worked best for both of them, and for as long as they were both happy, not because something like marriage dictated how they act and that they remained together. Paradoxically, being transsexual meant that Lou transcended his embodiment inasmuch as he identified as a gay man with or without hormones and surgeries that modified his female body. But he was also terribly constrained by his embodiment because those very modifications were necessary for him to be able to live in the world as a gay man or as the gay man that he knew himself to be. In effect, he was constrained by societal expectations about gender and embodiment. And Lou had to modify his body not only to be able to feel connection with others, but within himself as well. I, it, I find it very sad that after 
Lou and Keith broke up. Lou never found another long-term partner. It was actually shortly after he moved out from the home that he shared with Keith. It's actually a matter of days uh, when he got his AIDS diagnosis. Uh, he, he was feeling so excited, like, okay, well, you know, it's been kind of tough these past few years. It's just been so sad. You know, it seems like we're at this impasse. You know, uh, Lou was just having, Lou was having a hard time feeling like Keith saw him as a man. Even though Keith, from his perspective, saw Lou as a, as a man. Because Lou was so uncomfortable with his body. And he so badly wanted to have bottom surgery. And he felt like after having bottom surgery that you know, he just he, he couldn't continue to have a relationship with Keith because of, how, of Keith's preferred method of sex. So it just ended up being pretty tough for them, uh, the past year or two of their relationship. So Lou finally moves out. He's feeling all excited about these new changes that are coming. And wham, he ends up in the hospital and, and was just dumbfounded with his AIDS diagnosis. Because, you know, for several reasons, you know, um, where he was coming from, you know, he, he had relatively few sexual partners, especially compared to his, um, his contemporaries. And also, you know, he, I think, also thought he was immune because he was trans. You know, AIDS was seen as a gay, gay man's disease. And he himself didn't, didn't know that he, I, I, I guess, was fully a gay man that could then get this gay disease, if that makes sense. Um, so he was really shocked when he got his diagnosis. And he was also devastated by it. Because, um, to back up too, um, what actually caused him to start, sorry, uh, or to start getting full-blown AIDS was complications he ran into after he had his bottom surgery. But his body had such a hard time, um, you know, there were just all sorts of surgical complications, and that seemed to have compromised his immune system. And then, boom, next thing you know, he's got full blown AIDS. But he was, you know, here he had been so excited, you know, looking forward to enjoying, you know, the, this body that he had long wanted and finally had. And then suddenly he had this AIDS diagnosis. And here is something that he wrote in his journal about that. I guess I just feel that my body has been one big burden throughout my life. And getting this fatal disease, one that can be transmitted to anyone who loves my body, is just the last straw. Just knowing that this is the way I will be until I die is so hard to accept. <clears throat> This was definitely one of Lou's darker moments, because on the whole, he tried to, to have a more positive outlook, because uh, he very much believed, you know, having a, a more positive attitude would, would help him to live longer. And after he got through kind of the, you know, the, the shock and, and depression of his AIDS diagnosis, he also then was able to, to start using it for good. And that's something that is just incredible about Lou, is that every single challenge or, or thing that you know, folks could feel like might be holding them back, he used this actually as an opportunity to do good in the world. For example, you know, um, identifying as a, as a gay trans, right? They supposedly didn't exist. Okay, well, Lou then dedicated his life to ensuring that everybody knew that they existed, right? As soon as he got his, his AIDS diagnosis, uh, he was determined to then help educate folks, you know, trans people about AIDS. Um, and here is another, I'd like to, to read to y'all too, because something that I had just kind of wondered is, you know, how differently might Lou's life have been had he not moved out to San Francisco when he did? You know, what, what, what would his life have been like had he never left Milwaukee, right? It's true that maybe he never would have gotten AIDS and died, but also would he have been able to become a man? But Lou never had any regrets. There was a, this particular gender professional who asked Lou 
one point whether contracting AIDS had caused him to regret transitioning. And Blue had actually more or less asked himself the same question a few weeks earlier while he was sitting in this bar in the Castro called Moby Dick's, surrounded by all of these young, lean, smiling boys. Here's what Blue wrote in his journals. I've come all this way, gone through this whole change. Now what? My future compressed into a shortened time slot. Most dead in two years. Some live for five. What have I been striving toward? Oh, to be normal. To be a mere victim of my lust instead of having orchestrated my desires, my place here. Yet it's been worth all the years just to be in this bar here, now, with AIDS, and to be a man among men. Not to have to wonder if they think I'm a female. That I know is no longer an issue. To be included, however voyeuristically, however theoretically, in the society of men who can only openly proclaim their ardor <coughs> for other men, as those within this bar, I have gladly endured these years and these trials. It may be the love that dare not speak its name, but it is surely the love that endures, that persists against all condemnation, even through the threat of death, of AIDS, a love that cannot die. To me, this is the only real love. And he told the gender professional, no, I have never regretted changing my sex, even for a second, despite my AIDS diagnosis, and in some twisted way feel that my condition is proof that I really attained my goal of being a gay man. Even to the finish, I am with my gay brothers. Lou had a, a heck of a time trying to transition. <laughs> because gay trans men supposedly did not exist. But he was able to eventually um, access hormones and also undergo surgery through physicians in, in private practice. And through his diligence um, and persistence, Lou was able to play a big role in ensuring that the gender professionals knew that gay trans men existed and that they would no longer um, automatically exclude folks from services who identified as gay. And Lou's AIDS diagnosis actually helped out with it in a lot of ways, because again, you know, AIDS was seen as a gay disease. And it seemed like suddenly folks would listen to Lou now about being a gay man after he had gotten his AIDS diagnosis. Here's what Lou wrote in his journal in the first journal entry after his AIDS diagnosis. It really hasn't hit me that I'm about to die. I see the grief around me, but inside I feel serene and a certain kind of peace. My whole life I've wanted to be a gay man, and it's kind of an honor to die from a gay man's disease. Gender programs and professionals decided that I couldn't live as a gay man, but I am going to die like one. In his correspondence, publications in the gay and trans <laughs> presses, lectures, interviews, conversations with other FDMs, any time he spoke about his identity after being diagnosed with AIDS, Lou would repeat derivations of that final sentence. They decided that I couldn't live as a gay man, but I am going to die like one. I'll just uh, read one last thing to you all. And it's actually the, the very last thing that Lou ever wrote. It's just one sentence long. I'm sure there's a lot more I should be writing here, but I'm going to sign off here.